So I'm so, first of all, I'm so excited. We have so many women filmmakers in the festival this year. It's, it's really exciting to see, you know, I've been doing this for 23 years and it's not just the number of, you know, harder and harder to find films, um, you know, to put the films in the festival. We have to make so many hard decisions. And this year was a particularly hard year. And, uh, but then when we were going through trying to put together this BIPOC women panel, I was like, oh my God, there's like, there's like 20. This is like unbelievable and amazing. So, uh, so we're excited. Uh, and then we're excited about your films. We're excited for you all to have opened the festival. And Tata, you've been in our festival before. And uh, so, yeah, so we just sort of wanted to get an idea. And we put both of your films together because they sort of had some, they had, they were thematically. Uh, um, connected to each other about high school and um, and girls bullying and like all this stuff. So I, I hope that you agree with that. <laughs> so um, so why don't you tell us and Tata, why don't I start with you about a little bit about your film uh, so we can do that as a base and then why you felt compelled to make this film. You're on mute. Memoirs of a Black Girl is my first uh, feature film. And it's about, uh, it's focused on this girl named Aisha, who is brilliant, uh, who is amazing. And she's up for a scholarship. And uh, what happens is uh, she ends up um, uh, being put in a tough situation. Um, and she had to make the decision to give up the names of girls who uh, were smoking in the bathroom. and all that sort of unravels in the film and the consequences we see her navigating all of that, the challenges of high school. And uh, she's still, um, you know, keeping her eye, eyes on the, on the prize to get the scholarship. So that's in, um, in short, that's what uh, Memoirs of a Black Girl is about. Um, and I was uh, compelled to make this film because uh, um, I was teaching in Roxbury um, at a school in Roxbury Medicine Park for many years. And I found that uh, I spent a lot of time with my students uh, literally the whole day because it's a vocational school. So we had opportunity to watch lots of films, um, to make films, but also watch films. Um, and I got a little frustrated because uh, there was a real scarcity in um, coming of age stories, especially based in um, urban schools uh, with uh, uh, characters of color. And when I did uh, find the, the films, it was mostly uh, focused, uh, centered on young black boys. Mm -hmm. Very few were centered on, uh, especially in high school, on um, black girls. So for me, I was like, you know, black, black girl stories matter, uh, representation matters. And I want my students to be able to see themselves in a film that uh, is is reflective of that world. And I decided to, um, to make the film. And uh, I read somewhere where, I think it's a quote, I, I need to find out who said it, but this, they said, if you don't find the book that you wanna read on the shelf, mm -hmm. uh, write it. And I said, you know what? I did not find the movie that I wanted to watch. And I decided, especially for my students, and I decided to make it. So that really uh, was, why, uh, why I made this film. I was, I had in mind my students and I had in mind, I wanted to honor their stories and I wanted to say, I see you, I applaud you, I love you and uh, your stories deserve to be seen. Yeah, I mean, I think that com that completely comes across in your film and as well as yours too, Jen. So why don't you talk a little bit about Afro and um, and and the reason why you felt that it needed to be made as well. Yeah, um, Afro uh, started off with kind of an unusual journey of getting made. Um, I wrote the script um, because I was submitting to this Issa Rae, like kind of new normal creative contest. Um, and this was years ago. And it really just wanted to like depict the kind of new normal or what your experience was like coming of age. And for me, like Afro was really how I kind of felt coming up like, I think, you know, we are so quick, especially to judge and like when you live in predominantly white areas, what you are is a depiction of your race, what you represent. Um, so many kids get put on them that they have to represent the whole mm -hmm. race has to be done in a stereotypical, very narrow way. 
And I experienced that. Um, I experienced being teased from the black kids because I talked a certain way or I like certain interests. I experienced the white kids' racism and issues on the other end. And it kind of leaves you just feeling like you don't have um, an identity that which you really understand what your black culture means. So I think for Afro, I was looking for a way to talk about all those things um, but, you know, as you see in the film, do it from a very female centric perspective, because, you know, there's so much that goes into being a young black woman, um, hair politics is one of them. So, of course, Afro just felt right to, to put that in the mix. And well, as just understanding who you are, where you come from, your ancestors, your, ancestors. Lineages, your lineage is from, you know, you know, your family and, and who you represent. So I think for me, I wanted to put that in a script, but do it in a comedic way that I thought um, could very easily be relatable um, to kids that go through it and, and to adults that have been through it. And I think the one thing is it can transcend because whether you're a different race or, or going through just having, you know, an identity crisis, <laughs> uh, I think you can relate to the main character. <laughs> yeah, and her, and her just trying to figure it out who she is and going through that, um, uncomfortable comedy <laughs> that's within the within the film so it was like a little love letter to myself I think as a as a young a young girl and it just felt um so great to have it resonate with so many people and audiences seem to um really find something in it that um feels good to them and makes them feel like you know they have a way to express themselves freely without being put in a box which I really love I know, I mean, for both of you, I think that that is, that's so important with your films. I mean, to be able to be representative of, and, and even as an adult, you can see yourself in both of these stories. You know, you've had these experiences and, you know, Tata, you're right. It's like when, you know, and I was raising my son, it was sort of like, I could never find books. I couldn't find children's books that that were had black or brown kids in them. And it was like, you know, it's so funny because building thir building 19 in Natick was like the only place I could go to find like dozens and dozens of books. It was crazy to think about that. But, you know, in so much of the work that we're seeing at Rock's Film, it is about representation. And, and you all sort of like have stepped up to that plate. And so what, what were some of the challenges though in, in making a film like this? And, and one of, I think, to talk about too is fundraising for films that are maybe outside of what you know traditional films that funders want to fund so and can you just talk a little bit about that and then you know add it into that being a black woman doing this uh well uh, <laughs> funding is an issue uh the grants are very scarce and very uh, competitive. Um, and and I, I think for me, it was even more challenging because the last film I made was uh, 10 years ago uh, before I made uh, Memoirs of a Black Girl. But I was just like so ready to make it that I didn't want to um, make uh, a shot. I didn't know how to compress it into a shot because the advice we get all the time is like, make a shot and then maybe, <laughs> You know, so I was like, no, uh, maybe someone will really connect with this, but nobody connected with it. And I can understand because uh, if you haven't made uh, a feature, you're not going to get funding because there's other more, I, I think people look for experience. Can you really handle a feature? And mm -hmm. it's the irony, right? You apply for funding to make your first feature, but the fund, the funders always want to see you like what you made. Um, and I, the other thing is, I didn't want to submit my old uh, films from 10 years ago. They, it was mm. like, I cringed when I looked at them. So I was like, <laughs> no, you know, 10 years ago, that's so different. Anyway, so. Um, well, everything was different. The way you make movies, oh it's God. a show. I mean, I, I, I get that, but it's true. I, so what do you have? What's your calling card, right? Yeah, so uh, fortunately, I think I got it. I was a finalist for the Mass Cultural um, mm -hmm. uh, Grant uh, and, I think it came with, uh, I'm trying to remember how much it was. It was little. $5,000 or something. No. Or it, maybe 2,500. I think it's 1.5, but I'm trying oh. to remember it was 1.5. But that was something. To be honest, when I looked at uh, where, I mean, when I got it, I was like, I'm going to put it to, towards my film and I'm hoping to get more money. 
Um, so we ended up having to do an Indiegogo and we also self-funded. Uh, when I say we, I meant my husband and I, uh, because it was just tough. And, and I had to like reflect on, uh, because I, I'm 45, um, maybe you should cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> As long as we all don't have to tell our age, you're right. fine. When I entered my when I entered my forties, that's when it dawned to me that I'm running out of time. I mean, I know I have a long life ahead of me, but I just felt like, oh my God, I'm forty, and I still haven't done what I wanted to do. I had this plan for my life, and I was just sort of like now um, in a very impatient state, and and I said to myself, I'm gonna get it done, whether. I'm going to say yes to myself because I was getting no's, 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 no's. And I was like, sometimes you just have to invest in yourself. If no one wants to invest in, in your dream, you are the only one who can invest in it. So I figured out to make it, uh, to make this film. And I had a long conversation with my husband. And uh, thankfully I have um, a husband who believes in me, supports me. So that helped a lot uh, in trying to figure out how we can financially, um, I pay for the film and I had I have friends and family that pitched in that helped us. I had the community that also helped us because I didn't pay for a lot of locations because people would just open that doors for us. Mm -hmm. And that was a lovely thing that saves us, uh, saved us a lot of money. So the community in Roxbury was just so welcoming and it made the film much more easier to make. Uh, I mean, uh, to be honest, it, it was challenging. Production was challenging, the logistics, because um, you are thinking uh, in a high school, Jen, you can, uh, you can understand this. Doing mm -hmm. a movie set in high school is the most challenging thing because you are dealing with classrooms. Because you have to spill, you, you have to fill the space. You have mm -hmm. to fill the classroom. You have to fill the hallways. And I didn't think about that deeply because I was like, oh, we'll just get extras that can come in and out. But then, you know, like when you're asking people to commit and you want to guarantee that they show up because the last thing you want is to start production and there's just your main actors and some ex ex extras are not showing up because first of all, they're not getting paid. So we had to pay them just so they can we can guarantee that they yeah. show up. Well, that's so good, that though. to me was like, yeah, no, it was great because a lot of people are like, you can get it done, just get extras, you don't have to pay them. But I, I had to make the decision to pay them so I can guarantee that we're not waiting for people to fill up our spaces. So it was challenging. Um, but fortunately, we had a um, production manager who was so organized. I'm not the most organized person, but Cindy managed, um, who's my former student, by the way, from Medicine Park. Yeah. managed the uh the production and uh she um was running like the like she really she's really good at organization uh, organiz she has great organizational skills so that really helped a lot um so yeah i know and, it's so yeah, funny yeah. that uh, it's so funny that you okay. go ahead Oh, sorry. Uh, making a film as a black woman uh, in terms of, I think for me, I always have to be careful who I bring into my team because I've learned a lot uh, along. I mean, we I've had uh, horrible experiences, uh, but what I know now is what I don't like, uh, what I don't want. I want people to look like me. I want people to believe in this vision and have some kind of um, uh, connection with the, with the piece. That way they they feel the way I, they feel the uh, they that as dedicated as I am in, in making the film and I find that when you hire someone especially who doesn't look like you uh, sometimes it's just uh, like it doesn't really w work out that well but I was fortunate with you know like the crew was diverse but it was mostly um, people of color and that was awesome the energy was positive and it makes it so much easier as a black woman, uh, as a woman on set, to be directing um, some, some people like male people, uh, when you understand, uh, when you are identifying the male people that you want to be around that are supportive of your leadership. Because leading- I know, I mean, I think, that, I, mm -hmm. I think that that's a really important point too, is that um, there's like a short, shorthand language right there's like things that you don't necessarily have to explain and understand if you have a set 
that is predominantly of color and you're not doing that. I think it's, um, I think it's interesting that both of you, you know, well, that's why your films are together, um, that you're both in high schools and those challenges. And, uh, um, and, and then, you know, I mean, just, just like raising that money. So Jen, you, you're, you're working in this business all the time and, um, and are doing things well now virtually, but, you know, and you, and yours was a short, uh, but I know that you ran into the same sort of issues uh, about like making your film and. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So um, I'm a commercial documentary director and I'm starting to do more long form projects as a writer as well. So for me, it's, it's kind of, you know, these shorts that I've always done to build my reel and to build up to, you know, projects like Afro and more have always been self-funded or always been, I've had to work five other things and then put the money into it. I mean, an Afro was no different. I think the difference for me is I was at a, thankfully at a time in my career where, you know, I'm making money from other projects where I could put it to it. And I, we did a small um, seed and spark um, that helped mm -hmm. supplement money um, that I put in myself. But I, I think you nailed it on the head. I mean, I, my dad, um, my late father always told me like, nobody will invest in yourself like you. And so I take that with me and I believe in myself. And I think that spirit radiates to my crew and the people I work through and, and, and I get them to believe in my projects. And it's not easy. Um, I think the stories that you want to tell, especially a lot of times as a person of color and as a black woman, I want to tell stories where I feel centered, where I feel that mm -hmm. there's topics and issues that I have faced. I don't know any other life. So that's the way it's <laughs> going to be. And I'm not, I'm not here to um, change that. Um, I'm going to write what I want to write and I'm going to build what I want to build. I think my expertise has honed over the years as I've gotten more experiences and done bigger projects. Um, but you know, that comes with still a unique vision and a unique POV. And I think it is very difficult because I, I, you know, it's kind of this thing in the industry when I have meetings and I get notes and I submit to projects, you know, I'm, I'm kind of have one of the people that get finals on a lot of things, thankfully, but then I get notes back and the more I get notes, sometimes the notes just make it seem like everything else. And I'm like, no, I'm trying to do this because my point of view is, uh, yeah. and it's like, People in the industry, especially when you're not of color, they look for familiarity, even though they go, I like you, Jen, because you have a fresh voice. I'll turn around and they'll slowly make my voice by their notes and what they think less fresh. They'll slowly make it something they relate to. And I'm not here to explain colloquial terms. I'm not here to explain. I'm going to just write this dialogue and you do your research and you figure it out. You can Google. This is that experience that I feel is unique and the world needs to see. So I think... You know, that's kind of my point of view as far as the difficulties um, of directing. I mean, I direct in, like I said, all the lanes, commercial narrative doc for networks. And, you know, it is hard. I think um, now that I get the, some bigger projects, that trust factor is the difficult mm -hmm. one. It's that they let me in the door, but then now will you trust me to do my job? And a lot of times, even my EPs wow. work across the board with white directors or male directors, they'll notice the difference. So it's not me, it's not in my head. They can see the- No, body. of course it's not in your head. Yeah. That's, it's, and it's, navigating it's, that is- Exactly. Frustrating. Because the industry is difficult in general. There's like a baseline of difficulty, but I think even my EPs that will be white will go, whoa, like this doesn't happen with, you know, Dan. I'm like, yeah, because they let Dan, Dan do his job. You, they let Dan do his job. This doesn't happen with Laura. They let Dora do his job. And there is a bias with women in the industry too, which is something we could talk about in general, no matter what color you are. But I think particularly being a black woman in the room, that is what I'm like dealing with at this moment in my career. It's that I might get the job. I probably had to do 800 presentations to get it. And Dan had to do none. And then when I get it, they're like on top of me so much because there isn't that inherent trust that they would give that white cis male guy for some reason. And that's the barrier. And that's the deep discussions of nuance and biases that is tough. That's a tougher hurdle to get by. So that impacts everything you do from fundraising, to you know, working with your diverse cast and crew because they a lot of times they are diverse. The people that I hire on this Afro project, you know, most of my crew was women. Most of them were diverse. I would say over eighty percent. Um, 
So that's something I pride myself on, but I'll get projects that don't allow me to always do that. So I would tell any filmmaker, like there's a point where sometimes you just gotta go for your own thing. The grants, the competitions are great and they can supplement your dreams, but there is a point where you, if you have to work that overnight job or, you know, have your parents <laughs> help you, you know, work a side gig, you just, if you want it, you just got to find a way. And it's, it's really a tough thing to ask a lot of directors of color. And I get that, but it's, it's right now, it's the only way. Yeah. Tato's nodding a lot. <laughs> I mean, so true, Jen. Um, it's just, I, I, I came to that conclusion. And I think when I was looking at my age, I was like, I'm going to sit for the next 10 years waiting for someone to say yes. Oh, I'm going to make this film and not wait anymore. So I just made my choice to get it done. Um, it also helps you look, look 25. So. It's what? It also helps you look 25. So no one's going <laughs> to. <laughs> yep. Yeah, like, I know. You. Can you believe that? <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I just want to, I know I, I said we were only going to talk about this, but, but this is fascinating to me. And I just, um, I want to know how, is it, is is it the same when you're like navigating the film festival circuit? Is it the same when you're in, you know, in it when you when you get to that point and you're just, and you're looking at distribution and you're using film festivals as a way to get your film out there? Do you find that as you're submitting to festivals or talking to other people that it's like, oh yeah, that's great, but it's not familiar. It's not what we're sort of looking for. But oh my God, it's a great film. It's a great film. Yeah, if they don't have a Black Lives Matter theme in their festival or like a hub or a program <laughs> thing, it's harder to get in because they like, where do we put this? Where do we program it? And a lot of what the programmers think is coming from their life experience of how they want to program. And then that allows, and usually those people are not Black, they're usually white and they see the world from a different view. So they don't maybe have particular things we want to see programmed. But when we submitted Afro to some of the black, big black film festivals, they it was such an open world for them because all the categories were up for grabs. You know, <laughs> sure, it's like you comedy, you got a little drama that like, you know, you're get so narrow. And then I think just starting to go, this isn't a black project, this isn't anyone's project with black mm -hmm. people that are telling their experience. You should relate, you shouldn't reject it. So that's where we're trying to get. True, it's true. Uh, I think I felt the same way. Someone advised me, don't uh, raise your uh, hopes high for uh, white film festivals uh, because you'll get, uh, you'll start questioning yourself as a filmmaker because you are going to get all this nose because they don't see uh, your vision or they don't, uh, that thing, like she said, um, Jen said, uh, they're only judging you through that lens and it's tough. I mean, um, I, I guess it's a natural thing, uh, but we were blessed to be accepted by mostly black film festivals that we su uh, submitted to and also the local uh, film festivals. Um, so I'm like, uh, we, we've been doing well in terms of just uh, how we strategize with uh, what we're gonna do for our submissions. Um, and we are also blessed that we are in talks right now um, with a distributor, um, we are almost at the end of the process. So that has been such a blessing because that was the point of the film festival. How they found us was through Pan African Film Festival, like in January, and they we've been talking to them ever since. Um, and this distributor, the head uh, of acquisition, is actually a black guy, and he saw the film, and that helped a lot because I think, um, and and what he said was like they are now trying to getting more black films into the roster. roster. So uh, I think there is uh, an agency or there's now kind of like a recording with Hollywood where they're like, oh, wait a minute, like look at our catalog. Can we try to secure some of this, uh, some of these films that are out there? So I think for me, um, I, was, I was surprised by the nose, but I was reminded that, that those were likely gonna happen and I shouldn't. <laughs> so when I got my ASs from my favorite film festivals, I, I, was, I, I was happy because you know, you get it. That's uh, our stories matter and they matter to uh, our communities, right? Uh, so 
navigating film festivals is, is, is tough and it's expensive, but I think it's, uh, for me, for distribution is sometimes the, the best way to put your, uh, to get um, exposure or distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think definitely. I mean, I think, um, you know, we are, for, for Rock's film, we are fiercely independent. I mean, that's what we want. Yeah. We want established and emerging filmmakers, but really it's about the stories. It's about the stories that we never really get to see. It's really about the stories and giving those voices a voice, um, yeah. like, like, like your two films and many others. So um, I just want to close with you know, it's been a crazy year. You you all like pulled off films and in COVID. I mean, you know, you know, you're black women, so that I don't know why I should have a, a talk about that. But um, but, but just um, just how does it feel to be sort of on the other side of that, being finished, and then like moving forward with with your next with your next projects? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I you know. You know, we filmed Afro kind of and finished it right before, you know, the pandemic hit. Um, but, you know, obviously the film festival circuit completely changed um, and how it got distributed. But I, I definitely think there were some upsides to that, that we, we, we tried to find the bright side of a tragic situation that happened to the world. And I think, um, you know, we were able to have maybe eyeballs that wouldn't see it in person, see it online, connect with people in a more virtual way, up our social media reach. And those are things that I think I learned that they were before something actually to do and we do it, but I think it became a necessity to do. Um, that really taught me how important that stuff is when it comes mm -hmm. to getting uh, recognized with your films and projects. I think for me as an artist, um, it was actually a really great thing. Um, I was thankfully not, didn't have any family members directly impacted by COVID in a negative way. So that was something that, you know, I can take and I know other people can't say that, but I think one thing it made me do is kind of go inward and I wrote a feature. Um, I have another film in development. Afro is actually in development to be a series. Um, I attached with the showrunner um, and we both, um, she has a couple of shows on major networks and I'm co-producing it with her. I think a lot of those connections really were heightened because I think of, Tana, we were talking about the, um, the, the need there for people to, you know, get black artists, but yeah. and retain them. And that whole like movement, um, I think helped people have to be forced with, you know, hey, this is something that's you know, really, you, you can't ignore anymore. We're going to break down this door. We're going to, we're coming for, you know, the, you know, the awards rooms. We're coming for the networks. We, yeah, right. We're coming for your boardrooms, hire, you know, black people. Yeah, that's it. That's and, what you need to be. Uh huh. Yeah. And I think, you know, that, that was, that's great. I hope it sustains. I'm always ready for it to fizzle. I think it becomes a trend sometimes and not a mandate, but I, but I think in order for it to become a mandate, it's on me and people around me to continue to hire and elevate ourselves so we can pull others forward. So, you know, with that said, I think you're right. As black women, we do what we have to do. We always have, we've always fought <laughs> to, to move forward regardless of circumstances. And I think if anybody's built for this, we are. So it just ends up working. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, yeah, uh, memoirs, as you know, it was shot um, 2019, um, just the summer before the pandemic. Um, and we were in post-production uh, when, um, when the pandemic hit. We actually, two weeks before you came to the fundraiser, uh, I don't know if you right. remember. That's remember. right. Oh, we had this fundraiser to uh, launch our Indiegogo, and that uh, COVID upended that. And it was hard to ask for people, uh, ask people for money. For money, that's that right. And we just kind of like we can't. Like people are suffering. Like it's right. just uh, me, I always see it as a luxury, and to say, hey, help me make my film. Give me this money when people uh, have to pay rent. And so we kind of let that go um, for a couple of months and. We never went back to it. I was never comfortable to revive the uh, Indiegogo farmers. We did get some money, fortunately, uh, just before the pandemic. But after that, we we're like, no, we, we can't. Um, but what ended up happening was that, you know, post-production is really sort of like, it's the best 
uh, is the best, uh, it's best suited for COVID, right? Because, you know. Right, so right. You're inside and you're, and you're right. You're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So the editor, um, so it was good because I was able to actually uh, negotiate with, because um, a lot of people were out of work for many, many, many months. Uh, so when we resumed post-production, it was around, um, I think, September, October. Uh, but at that point, the, the, the cost of the codes that I've been coded were drastically down low from different people. And I was surprised because I think from March until the fall, a lot of people in the industry had nothing, especially- Oh, well, they weren't working. People, I know, and, people yeah, weren't working. I was able to negotiate. So in a way, I mean, it was good for the film, but at the same time, you know, like people now actually drop. So somehow I was able to afford <laughs> finishing the film with the little that we had. Um, so we we were able to uh, finish the finish it uh, get it ready uh, in November. But what was funny was that when we went uh, to do the res the reshoots in the summer, um, we did a little bit of shooting in the summer because I looked at the weather. I was like, it's gonna look different. Uh, the leaves are gonna turn. We better get this uh, uh, B roll that we needed to get. Uh, when we went outside, people were wearing masks. Right. <laughs> Like how do we avoid? So we 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 had this trick to shoot from behind, like if pedestrians are, are passing by from afar. Like it was just like so. We ended up actually going aerial. That's why there's a lot of aerial. If you remember the movie, there's a lot of aerial shots. We right. Because we didn't, we couldn't do like the, you know, moving. You couldn't say the, take off your mask. We're well, like we. <laughs> um, so anyway. Violate. So, violating challenge but it you know it worked out like we you find a way where there's a way uh where yeah. we found a way to get it done um i think we it's just a blessing it's a it's a blessing that uh we're able to actually finish this film um i i at some point i was like this is probably gonna stay in a hard drive for a while i i was not sure whether we'll finish it but you know um it's just oh we are excited that you did we're excited that it, we're well I'm, I'm always excited because i know that when you finish your films and you get them on the festival circuit that you can breathe a sigh of relief and then move on to your next project so yeah. we're, we're excited to have them we're excited to have you both share with us on opening day yeah your films we hope the audience um enjoyed them i know that they i know that they did and uh and we'll look for your names and your things, all the stuff that you're going to be doing going forward. Yeah. So, um, so until then, again, definitely submit again. Tato's on to her next movie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank and um, you. it was great meeting you. I think that I, I feel like your characters need to be in the next movie together. I know, like I saw a scene and I was like, oh my God, like I love, like, I, I can't wait to see it, uh, Jen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the little the mashup. The three yeah, little mashup, like, totally. Yeah. I have that scene with the three girls when Aisha at the beginning and had the three right. girls. It was just like, oh my goodness. Um, Great money. Like, like, right, she could have been the other end of the corridor. That's yeah. right. Like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> wait to see. You need a re-edit, a re-edit. <laughs> re-edit. All right. Thank you both so much. So thank exciting you. to talk thank to you. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, I'll email you. It sounds, yes. Your work sounds wonderful. I love yes, to connect up with you. <laughs> I mean, this is what we would be doing in person. We'd be able to connect and you guys would have lunch and talk. And but now you can. You've met virtually. So that's great. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Lisa. Bye.